I want to remind everyone that all of my content is also available on YouTube if you want to watch us talk as well as listen to us talk. And while you're there, go ahead and give me a follow. I need 1,000 followers on my YouTube channel before I can monetize it and run ads. So every single follow helps me get closer to that. I appreciate it. My guest today is Dr. Loie Medvin. She is a licensed psychologist, and we talked about one of her many modalities, which is called somatic therapy. And it's um, basically how emotions manifest in the body and can result in disease, um, such as, you know, tension in the shoulders or anxiety in the stomach and different parts of the body where emotions manifest. And the first half of our conversation was, well, about therapy, but then we also started talking about society and culture and how there's some kind of systemic cultural diseases that I think that we all share and how some of the ways that we were raised and brought up and many of the ways that our culture still operates today, how these can contribute to harmful states of mind. Um, we talked a lot about the masculine feminine dynamic in our culture between men and men and women or whoever you are out there. Um, and how basically I don't want to give everything away, but we talked about how one of the root problems that we all suffer from is a sense of separation and how we can begin to feel more connected to ourselves and to other people. And the last half of our conversation, we went in a totally different direction and started talking about psychedelics. And I was very interested to hear uh, a perspective on psychedelics from a licensed healthcare professional. And uh, Dr. Lowy shared many of her personal experiences and we ended up going deep into ayahuasca and marijuana, LSD, and we went way out there, started talking about DMT and interdimensional experiences, cosmic consciousness, things like that. So it got pretty trippy at the end, which was cool. Uh, I'm glad we brought it there. And it was, a, it was a really good conversation overall. So hope you enjoy. here today with clinical psychologist, Dr. Lowy. And first off, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. I, I've been interested to talk to you about therapy and you have an interesting approach. You combine traditional therapy methods, but you also have some like alternative modalities that you practice as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about both just as a starting point. Sure. Um, hmm. Well, there's, that's quite a lot in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I'll give you a little background. Okay. First of all, um, so in my early training, I was really interested in what we call psychodynamic, <clears throat> um, which is based off. <clears throat> okay. Hope you edit that out. Um, I, I won't, but that's fine. She's got a little frog in her throat, but yeah. we'll get through it. Um, so, so early on, um, I was really interested in psychodynamic, which is kind of based on uh, Freud and psychoanalytic therapies. Um, basically came from viewing the therapist kind of as a blank screen from which you would just project all your stuff onto, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and then sort of later iterations of that, um, I found to be pretty useful, such as relational, uh, and intersubjective, which really use the, the therapy, the, um, being in the room, 
Mm -hmm. and what happens between the client and the therapist as kind of a, a, a model of what's actually happening out in the world. So using the information that you get, um, you know, how someone responds to you and reacts and the feelings that come up in you then um, inform the treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's insight oriented, but then also you're having more insight and there's kind of a shared, um, it's called the third, but uh, intersubjective experience, um, which was really fascinating to me. Uh, Okay, so so you're saying this is like uh, an, an evolution past Freud of <clears throat> mm -hmm. I didn't exactly understand everything you just said, but um, so you're saying that um, like Freudian psychology, you, you're the p patient is projecting everything onto the therapist or that's the that's the therapist view is that they're just a blank screen. It, it more so it was. You know, uh -huh. um, psychoanalytic therapy now is a little bit different, uh, and I, I don't practice that, but that's where um, you have you might have your um, client or patient lay on a couch mm -hmm. and free associate and just kind of come up. So mm -hmm. what their unconscious is uncovering. And you can go to some pretty deep uh, levels in mm -hmm. that way. Um, but as I <clears throat> learned more and uh, had different training, um, I just kind of kept adding things onto it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've, I've worked in a whole variety of settings, and those also help to inform and shape how I practice. Um, so I added in um, mindfulness, because I use that a lot mm -hmm. in my own life. Uh, and then, you know, working in a college counseling center, we had to do brief therapy. And so I first thought that was kind of crazy, you know, but, um, but I, Cra I, crazy why, um, because in the way that I had been trained and had been practicing, you needed time to really uncover what was there and what was going on and, and looking at, you know, early childhood experiences and how those affect you. Mm -hmm. um, and when you only have a very brief amount of time with someone, like the students who are coming in, when you did a triage session, you had that one session. Mm -hmm. Or you could do maybe eight to ten sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I gradually learned that you can actually address what's happening in the present <clears throat> and yes, what happened in your past influences you, but you don't have to get into all of it in depth. Mm -hmm. um, and gradually along the way, I brought into it also the um, uh, body awareness and somatic practice, mm -hmm. which is pretty foundational in how I practice today. Mm -hmm. um, and really you, well, we, we all... Um, we store our experiences, especially the traumatic ones, in our bodies. Um, and so being able to access that and bring that out <clears throat> is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And is that concept something, like how accepted is that in sort of mainstream academic psychology that our emotions are stored in our body? Is that <laughs> is that more of... Uh, like cutting edge psychology or alternative psychology, or is that kind of, is that now accepted? It's more accepted than it, than it has been. Uh -huh. Yeah. There's, um, there's even, I mean, there's many books on somatic therapy now. There's tr whole training programs focused in on it. Um, there's, uh, Peter Levine wrote, um, several different books and has trainings uh, the body keeps score those kinds of things um, so it's it is much more accepted uh, but not not all psychologists practice that way and and I think that not all of them believe that that is the way to actually access the unconscious mm -hmm. like I believe yeah I was a psychology undergrad and I was kind of amazed how well, first off, how far psychology has come just since, I don't know, since maybe like the 1950s or the 1920s, which that was a long time ago, it was 100 mm -hmm. years ago, but but still, it seems like 
<laughs> they were way, I mean, they were way off, like even before that. Um, but I was also surprised in my personal assessment or view that I feel like we still have a, a long ways to go, at least from what I learned, you know, just in kind of undergrad textbook psychology. I felt like that, and I, I didn't know about somatic psychology. Probably the most advanced thing I learned was evolutionary psychology, which talks about how not only has our body structure ev uh, evolved <clears throat> over time, but also many of the instincts that we have or behaviors or the ways that we think and behave are also evolutionarily based. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I was an undergrad from, I graduated in 2007. And at the time, um, yeah, they were saying that, that uh, you know, this is not fully accepted. Like not everyone believes this, but this is kind of the most cutting edge field. And I was surprised that there still are some kind of like hangers on hanger ons from like the old ways of psychology that, and the whole field is so broad in terms of what people <clears throat> believe you know and there is that kind of belief aspect that um because it's we're all so different as people and and um psychology is i think a lot harder to pin down than say physics you know um and i i think that there's a lot of things that we all share in common too that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were talking, I had so many different thoughts. So, <laughs> um, so there's, I think there's value in in our history and in the in particular the history of psychology, um, <clears throat> and many um, discoveries back then are still valid and still being used. I mean, you know, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's it's really uh, and to explain that a little bit, um, that's, um, focusing in on cognitive, that's your thoughts, you know, thought processes and, um, and your behavior and how they, um, impact each other, mm. you know, the relationship between them and, and how they'll influence each other and how, um, we, you know, we can be trained yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. We can train ourselves and we can train other people. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, there are many aspects of that that I utilize in the therapy that mm. I that I offer. Um, <clears throat> I would say a really exciting um, addition into the field in the past little bit has been epigenetics. And you know, I think when I was in when I was in college, it was nature versus nurture, you right. know, and and. Um, and they, what we now know is that they are both important mm -hmm. and they both impact each other and that you're born with a specific genetic loading, mm -hmm. you know, from your mother and your father or your parents. And then depending on the environmental influences, which include everything from, well, on, on you, everything from basically time of conception on mm -hmm. so you know the the things that your mother is feeling while you're in utero you're marinating in those chemicals those hormones that are being released mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and and they affect you mm -hmm. you know um and so you know what what she's eating and how she's feeling and the interactions that she's having then will help to shape the person that you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So if it's some, someone who is really, um, tends towards anxiety, then you're going to be kind of growing in that, you know, more cortisol, mm. extra adrenaline, you know, these, these different things that, that will probably amp you up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, now then you know how you're born impacts you in a huge way mm -hmm. um the foods that you eat the toxins in your environment um the experiences you have the the relationship you see your your parents and close people you know mm -hmm. all of that impacts you how much you're held <clears throat> probably how long you're breastfed oh totally mm -hmm. totally 
early early traumas again get stored somatically because you don't you you don't have the verbal capacity yet mm-hmm. to to speak about it mm-hmm. right so mm-hmm. it just gets stuck in your body um and and that all so it, it doesn't change the genetic structure but through this methylation process it can change um whether the genes are really turned on or turned off mm-hmm and and so then how that looks and how that manifests Mm -hmm. so say you're you're born with a genetic loading for anxiety and then you have experiences in your environment that add on to that Mm -hmm. you will probably be more of an anxious person Mm -hmm. you know same for depression and and all kinds of things Mm -hmm. and oh what is epigenetics what does that word mean exactly or i could look Um, it up um you know, the, the exact term, I mean, I, I described what it is basically. Yeah. Um, it's the combination of nature and nurture. It's basically, it's that you're born with that specific genetic loading okay. and then that environmental influences, um, they impact and change the expression of the genes. Yeah. And this is, this is the, um, I don't know, the extra, um, really, I think interesting part of it is that not only does it change it for you, but it changes it for your children mm-hmm. and further down the line. So, you know, you might, let's use the um, example of anxiety again. You might be a really anxious person. Your mom, your dad, they're not really anxious, but your grandmother was incredibly anxious and maybe she had some traumas, those can be passed down to you. Mm-hmm. And then you can manifest these um, these behaviors. Hmm. Even though it <clears throat> skips, a gen- it can skip a generation like that. Oh yeah, several. Wow. Yeah. Now the good thing um, for understanding this, because it can kind of be a lot of pressure, right? Yeah. You're thinking that, that everything you do, then you can potentially pass all that down to your children and grandchildren. And that's a lot of responsibility, (laughs) you know, but the, the good thing about it and, um, what I really like about it in terms of how it relates to therapy is that then you, you can come in or you can do it out in the world as well. But if you learn how to change those patterns of behaviors and thoughts, you can also pass that down. So mm-hmm. if you learn how to self-soothe, if you learn how to rewire your brain, you know, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so how do you, how do you help people do that? Because, um, and this is something that I've been interested to talk about, talk to a therapist about this and kind of more like of a different, um, approach because I've done a lot of this for myself through, um, plant medicine experiences and, um, just meditation journaling. But so like what professional kind of like tools do you have to help somebody basically like rewire themselves and, and kind of, they've got this, this current of psychological momentum that they're writing. How do they then like turn that river around? Um, well, it, it starts first with, um, awareness, Mm -hmm. conscious awareness. Um, and, and, um, let's see, I didn't actually say all the things that I do in my therapy, but, um, but one of them is, is I bring into it, um, my background in neuropsychology. Mm -hmm. I did my postdoc in that. Um, and that, that really, um, helped in, it also inform how I practice. And so <clears throat> what I learned in that is that when you are conscious and aware in the moment, you have the possibility to create a new neural pathway. You have a choice, mm-hmm. right? So if you're um, just going about your day, a lot of the time we operate unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And when you operate unconsciously, you're just going to do what you've always done. You know, if you've ever been driving to work and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, it's Saturday. I didn't need to go this way, Uh you know? Um, and you're not really consciously aware of what you're doing, obviously enough to drive. But, um, so first of all, it, it starts with being aware in the moment 
and recognizing you have choice and then choosing to do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there are, you know, ways that I teach. There's breathing strategies. There's there. Um, um, I also bring in some energy psychology, um, but there's um, different I would say different pathways to to go about to change what it is that you're doing, but it all starts with the awareness in the moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like to use little tricks. Um, if I if especially for really background things, like if I notice that I'm just in a pattern of negative thinking, for example, and I'm like, I want to, I want to remind myself as much as possible throughout the day to think positively. Mm -hmm. um, I'll wear a ring or something like that. I don't normally wear any rings. And so if I put a ring on, then every time I see that ring or touch that ring, it helps me to tune in. Mm -hmm. Where's my thought process right now? Right. So it like anchors you into. Yeah. And brings your awareness too. Because I'll still without something like that. Um, and I'm very kinesthetic. So thing, yeah objects and touching things like that's helpful for me um but without a tool like that i'll still kind of catch myself several points throughout the day but even more so with a little with an anchor like that so right right and it it is helpful to um to have different ways to bring yourself into that moment so what what i often do with people is that um I have them um, start to become aware of the sensations that are happening in their body in connection with whatever it is they're wanting to shift, you know. So um, if it's anxiety and they um, they may not even be aware of actually what's happening in their body at, mm. at first. So that's a, that's a whole nother process to teach people to tune in. Mm -hmm. Um, and be sensitive and aware of the, not just emotions, but also the physical sensations that are happening because that can also be an anchor. Mm -hmm. So if the first thing, and it's best to get as close to the beginning of when you're experiencing those things as possible. Um, So if the first thing is that their heart starts beating really fast, then every time they notice their heart beating fast, that's the signal. Mm -hmm. That's the message from your body. Like, okay, about to get really anxious, you know? And so then it's like, I used to liken it to, say you're driving down the freeway. You're, You're on 101 and you're going north and you see a sign for, um, say 116 for an off ramp. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can do the same thing you've always done, which is just go straight down and not take the off ramp. Mm -hmm. Or if you start to feel the beating of your heart, that's the sign, you notice the sign and you can choose to get off and go to a breathing thing or go do something else. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition, I also like to have people um, to, once they're noticing, you know, if it's a critical thought that they're trying to change or, um, you know, some, something happening, what they can do is, um, as soon as they notice it, drop into the sensation and then they can journal. Mm-hmm. They can just not at length, but write down a few things that also is another way to kind of anchor it in mm-hmm. and to, to put like, it's almost like a sticky note, like, Oh, here it is. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and the more you become aware of it, you know, the more you have the potential to then shift it. Mm-hmm. And the more that you choose the different behavior, the more it becomes a uh, more, uh, more well-traveled pathway. Right. And then it's easier and easier to get there. Right. That seems like a good <laughs> strategy to use for like addictive behaviors too. Or, or, well, we, yeah, we just have these patterns and pathways, right? That, and sometimes they're really deep grooves of behavior. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it it just strikes me when you're saying that, that that could be really helpful for overcoming kind of like compulsive type behaviors and thoughts and things like that too. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You and you just have to like stop that ball from rolling for a moment and just, or just catch yourself doing it, mm-hmm. create a space and breathe and kind of like reset and then make a new choice. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that is the way kind of the initial way 
that I teach Mm -hmm. people to do that. Eventually, uh, and what what really works well with intrusive thoughts and and um, sometimes even um, there's I've worked with people who have thoughts of of like hurting themselves or other people. You know, not they don't want to act on it, but mm-hmm. just these intrusive thoughts that come in. And um, one of the best ways to work with them then is after they've learned that process to interrupt it a little bit is to be able to notice it mm-hmm. and then notice that it's happening and let it be. So you're, you're not giving, you're not fighting against it. Mm -hmm. You're not giving it a lot of energy. You know, it's like, it's like the, the, um, obnoxious uncle at your Christmas, uh, or Thanksgiving table, you know, and you're like, Oh, uh, Hey, what's up? You know, and you you let them be, (laughs) he's going to stir up some shit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, have you noticed or are you aware either from your training or from your practice of kind of like common uh, roots between certain emotions and the body? Like, for example, a lot of people store stress in their shoulders. Do you notice or have you learned that um, like anger is stored in a particular place in the body or sadness or things like that? Yeah. Um, often, uh, sadness, you know, grief is, is kind of lung Mm -hmm. chest area. Mm -hmm. Um, anxiety can also be there. Uh, sometimes it's in the throat, Mm -hmm. throat and chest. Sometimes it, it might actually manifest as like, um, tight stomach. Mm -hmm. Often people, I have worked with many people who, um, have IBS or pain in their body. And after coming to therapy, they realize it's, it's that physical, um, state of dis-ease is actually a manifestation of, uh, extreme anxiety, mm-hmm. you know, or anger mm-hmm. for, for pain often. Um, so, um, I would say in, in anger, yeah, like kind of stomach, solar plexus, that area, mm-hmm. um, liver, you know, Mm-hmm. I think in Chinese medicine, it's like liver. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, certain people, you know, can store things a little bit differently and it can manifest in the body in different ways. But on the whole, yeah, I would say stress, responsibility, kind of shoulder, mm-hmm. shoulder, neck area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've had, I've had, um, moments of anxiety or periods of anxiety uh, at times and for me it manifests in my stomach mm-hmm. and sometimes I feel so anxious it's just it's hard to eat or it's hard to like digest properly mm-hmm. I'll notice mm-hmm. so I can only imagine what it would be like to have that all the time to just like have your stomach in knots all the time it would be terrible like yeah. you just wouldn't it just disrupt I mean it actually disrupts my digestive function I don't oh sure I can't, I can't eat as much. My appetite, I just can't put as much food in there. I just don't feel good. Like, yeah. And you shouldn't n- eat as yeah. much, you right, know, right. when, when your body's in a state of stress, you, you won't digest it as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like your, your nervous system is, is activated. And so, um, it shuts off your ability to really digest well because your, your resources are kind of mobilizing to, to get out of there, Mm -hmm. you know, to Mm -hmm. keep you safe. And that's going back to what you brought up sort of initially, um, in terms of like evolutionary psychology and biological function, you know, your body is designed to keep you alive and to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And so if there's something scary happening, you can't waste precious resources on digesting, Yeah, you know, you need to, to pump blood to your extremities to get them going. And get out of there yeah <clears throat> and that kind of makes me think about the kidneys and the adrenals too because i know so many people are overtaxed in that area mm-hmm. and i'm curious if if you know what that's related to like i imagine i imagine it to be kind of like a a fear fight or flight type thing maybe not to the extreme level of like actually feeling afraid of your life right but i think a lot of people are kind of in a heightened nervous system state yeah uh underslept overworked um compensating with caffeine 
Yeah. And we can get kind of burnt out in the, in those areas of our body. Totally. And, uh, our lives in general, I would say the majority of Americans are so stress filled, Mm -hmm. you know, just being out in the world in general, you know, you have, um, the news on, um, you have artificial lights, um, that are, that um, are taxing your system, you know, you have driving around, you have to be pretty alert, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you might not be aware in your life, but there's so many things that, that basically you're bombarded by stress, Mm -hmm. let alone, you know, actually working and family and relationships and money. yeah. Yeah. And money. I mean, the thing is, is that most people are kind of stuck in this going to work so that they can pay the babysitter so that they can go to work so that they can pay for their car so that they can go to work so they can drive around and you know buy their food from the store and then make it really quickly before they go to bed and then you know clean and um and just to pay for the the things that they have and yeah it's it's hard for many people to even think about much more than just kind of basic survival and then when they have a little bit of time they want to tune out yeah you know they want to distract disconnect because it's kind of hard right it's it's hard to be present when it doesn't feel good Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people go to uh i think yeah go to those compulsive (coughs) behaviors right and alcohol or little weed or um, Mm -hmm. TV or something. Yeah, just tune out, check out. Yeah, and I I mean, how I think of it is that that's really the disease of our our culture. Our Mm. age right now is disconnection, Mm -hmm. you know? if um, And what I help to teach people is how to reconnect, how to connect into themselves. Mm. Um, Because that, you know, I I also like to say that... um, the only way out of that kind of cycle, you know, is actually going in, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I often, this is something I think about a lot. It's just what, why are we like this? You know, like what, how did our society and culture get so backwards? I feel like it's backwards and, um, I don't know how many people feel that or see that, um, to me, it's obviously backwards, but a lot of people are just kind of plod, plodding along, doing the thing. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe they don't even have really time to think about it. Yeah. But, um, and, and travel has especially opened my eyes to this, just getting out of the country for a little bit and, and going yeah. to different places and seeing how different people live and even even really poor places where they have way less than we do. I see like a sparkle in people's eyes. There's, there's a happiness and there's a connection there, um, that I just don't, don't see here. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a sense of community in different places. So I'm curious what you think. I, I, I I wonder to myself a lot, like what are some of the factors that have brought us to this place of disconnection? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in in part, like I said, we're just, most people are kind of stuck in that. Um, But factors that have brought us to it, um, I don't know, probably capitalism. (laughs) You know, it's uh, the divide and conquer kind of, I'm going to get ahead of you. Mm -hmm. You know, the competitive culture that we have. Um, In in other cultures, it is more communal. Not mm-hmm. all of them, you know, but, um, and I think, I think it was a Japanese saying, um, but it's the nail that stands out gets pounded down. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to here, right? It's survival of the fittest. Right. And, and that doesn't encourage kinship. It doesn't encourage care for your neighbor, you right. know, which I think inherently we have that and we have the capacity for that. Unless there's been some traumas and, you know, Mm -hmm. in your life or maybe some, some ancestors life, but, um, we have the potential for that. Mm -hmm. And, 
Um, and in fact, in, you know, in ancient times, kind of our primitive drives are to be accepted, to be part of the tribe, to be in community. Mm-hmm. And that means doing for others. And that helps you to survive. Mm-hmm. We no longer have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was a huge part of ancient societies. And mm-hmm. especially in regard, well, this is the context I know it of in, <clears> but... Um, in regards to hunting because um, not every man or person who goes out hunting is going to be successful every time, but the person who is successful will share with other people. And then maybe the next time they're not going to be successful and another person will share with them. And yeah. And then different tribes trade different things with, uh, with each other and, yeah, I, this is something I also think about a lot is the balance or finding a balance between com- competitiveness and competition and cooperative, cooperative communalism, you could say. Um, personally, I think that there's value in both. I think our society is overly competitive, but I think that... Um, Competition and capitalism get a bad name <clears throat> because of the way that we practice it. It's mm-hmm. just like step on everyone to yeah. get to the top of the heap. But I think that there, there's definitely value in it. Um, like just for me in my personal life, um, I think boys tend to be more competitive than girls. And I mean, I've excelled in ways that I probably would not have if not for uh, like friendly competition with Mm -hmm. with some of my friends. Mm -hmm. Like um, in in third grade, I had a competition unspoken, but just we wanted to be better than each other uh, with a friend of mine uh, on our like times tables. And depending on how well you did on the times table, you got a certain amount of gold stars, right? And so he and I were skyrocketing past the entire rest of the class. And the teacher actually had to add to the chart to (laughs) put more gold stars on there. And I would, I'm sure I would not done nearly as well if not for that drive to like beat my friend, you know, but still at the end of the day, like we were, we were really good friends and, and there was no hard feelings. Right. Right. But then, yeah, there definitely is an extreme level that it can get to right. where especially where people are willing to <clears throat> harm others <throat> or look past the potential to harm others when you get at these like big corporations that are cutting corners on their oil rigs and you know mm-hmm. n- not just the oil rig that blew up but I mean I lived in Santa Barbara for a little while and there's yeah, offshore rigs there mm-hmm. and the freaking beaches, beaches are, yeah, yeah. They're just leaching oil all the time into the water, and I guess the government's just letting them do it. I don't know. Well, again, that goes back to disconnection, mm. and even what you're talking about. And there's a couple things there. You know, the competition is, yeah, is not necessarily a bad thing, but when it comes from a disconnected place, mm-hmm. when you don't care about the other. Right. You know, you and your friend, you, you still were friends and you cared about each other. Yeah. So you weren't trying to, you know, trip him or poke his eye out or like, yeah. you know, do something that would harm him so you could win. Right. Right. Um, and and there's something I want to, to bring up within that, too, is that the difference between men and women or the masculine brain and feminine brains, mm-hmm. um, because um, men uh, or the masculine brain does have um, somewhat different structure and function and in aspects Mm -hmm. you know the the corpus callosum the connector between the hemispheres is larger in in the feminine brain and so you know which is it's that connector it's the connector between the hemispheres yeah yeah so you have you know the right and left and then the connector between communicator as well yeah 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 yeah. It, it helps to facilitate communication between it's why um, you know, stereotypically, um, a man might just be thinking about one thing, mm-hmm. one thing and, and can be very goal oriented and directed mm-hmm. and then go to the next thing and the next thing. Whereas, um, 
you know, a woman or someone with a more feminine brain might think about that and then jump to something else that's associated and something else and something else Mm -hmm. and want to talk about it and talk Mm -hmm. about the feelings that go with it and, you know, and, and explore that. And meanwhile, the, the masculine brain is still on the very first thing, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't mean men are slow. It's just a different way of using Mm -hmm. their brains. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, uh, dangerous situations, you know, this is our brains have evolved from ancient times when it helped our survival. Mm-hmm. You know, if you had little children, you needed to look around and gather them together and, and talk mm-hmm. if, if you're a mom, mm-hmm. pretty much. And say the, the father, the dad, he needed to, if something, if saber tooth tiger was coming mm-hmm. at you, you know, you needed to either fight it or run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of research around the differences you know, on men and women in, in those arenas under um, under stressful situations. Mm-hmm. And then um, even, even with empathy, the empathic structures in our brains are different, mm-hmm. you know. And again, it, it goes to the stereotype, um, which I actually like to bring this up when I see couples because it helps them to not take it so personally. But how um, if in, in what we think of as normal empathy, you see something, you feel it as if you're feeling it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now with men, what happens is the temporal parietal junction gets activated. And so you see something, you feel as if you're feeling it yourself, pretty much, and you need to do something. You need to fix it, mm-hmm. right? And that's the stereotype that men can't just listen. They have to be like, whoa, have you tried this? Why don't you do this, you know? Right, solution-oriented. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. But that's actually what's happening in their brains. Mm-hmm. Those parts are activated, mm-hmm. you know, and the feminine brain is like, we see it, we feel as if we're feeling it. We want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. We want to be with our friends and, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, I tell people, well, if you want to talk about it, go talk about it with your other girlfriends, you know, or people who really want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, not that, not that there's not crossover, you know, and I'm speaking, um, in more general terms, but of, you know, masculine and feminine brains, there are differences. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's a huge gap of misunderstanding in general between men and women and just even just the sort of masculine and feminine aspects are of our society, which, you know, may be driven by a combination of men and women on each side. Yeah. And, um, um, I, I've spent a lot of time, uh, I'm just curious about people and, and curious about myself and just done, done a lot of kind of like personal experiments and just, uh, just trying to figure people out. And, um, I don't claim to understand women or even men for that matter, but, um, I, I'm curious. I try to figure out like, what are, what are the things that like, there's, there seems to be this divide and what are the things that each side is, is maybe missing about the other. And we hear a lot of the sort of woman's voice of like, what are the men missing? What are the men missing? Especially now in this time. Um, I mean, there's all of the like me too and, uh, sexual assault revelations, but I think, along with that or after that is just kind of been like another sort of wave of it's a lot more subtle, but just the ways that like men don't understand women, even if it's not like a man who is um, perpetrating assault, just that like there's been a revelation of basically just like how women feel in society, even Mm -hmm. if they're not being assaulted, but just Mm -hmm. that they feel kind of, unsafe Mm -hmm. right unsafe and and even like mansplaining right Right. mansplaining Mm -hmm. yeah behaviors yeah discounting women as as equal you know it's like there's a way of not honoring the experience and it's not specific to women um but but right now that's being highlighted right for sure have you felt that at all like um i mean i don't I don't know how much you want to share about it, but just like, do you, do you see that? Do you feel that? Um, do you see it in others or do you feel it in yourself? 
which all of it or yeah specific? all of it or or i mean yeah. i i'm just genuinely curious like as a man i'm curious of really about the depth like just what are women feeling yeah um oh and, yeah yeah it's it's huge i mean in all pretty much all of my sessions yesterday they were incredibly intense you know it's right now for this area it's anniversary of the fires as well mm. and that's bringing up stuff and then and for people who don't know because there's people listen to this from all over yeah. there there was um big california wildfires here firestorm um, firestorm mm -hmm. in this particular area burned down like a large yeah. part of santa rosa yeah many people lost their houses um their animals all their possessions yeah and that's that was a year ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so that's up you mm -hmm. know in the collective as well as you know the confirmation of kavanaugh and the the me too movement and so it's bringing up stuff mm -hmm. for people and so all my sessions were so intense yesterday and um and it's come up you know for me personally and in, you know, family and friends as well. It's like every time that you, that, that we as women have been um, harassed, there, there are no, I would say no women who have not been harassed. Right. Um, so harassed, molested, assaulted, raped, you know, any of those things, um, it's all coming up. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost like we can no longer ignore that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in our, um, it's so much now out in the open, mm -hmm. um, that the ways in which people have, have learned to hide those things, to distract, to dissociate from those experiences, not really working yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of people are being overwhelmed and, um, flooded and, um, you know, have to um get some support and learn how to come back to themselves um but yeah it's it's a big thing mm -hmm. you know and and i think it needs to come out and it's not it's not the fault of men yeah you know that's that's a big thing it's more this it's our culture it's mm -hmm. the patriarchal culture mm -hmm. and which is which is perpetrated by all of us yeah you oh know? yeah yeah. And, and we have, I mean, we have the masculine and feminine inside and sometimes, um, women are, um, equally as hard, if not worse to mm -hmm. other women, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, it's not to blame a gender, you know, by, yeah. by any means, but. Which I think is really important to say. And that's, that's what I feel too. But I, there, and I, I get, I get that there are women that are super angry and you know just uh thoughtless things come from places of anger but there's there's a lot of like man hating as well you know there is there is some blaming of the gender of the, yeah. the male gender happening and, and and I totally get I don't I don't have any blame for them having blame I get it yeah. but I see this time as more, yeah, more of like a, there's a collective healing process going on that's happening on, on both sides, happening for everyone. Um, personally, I feel like there could be more awareness or more attention brought to the needs of men in this time as well. I think that's important. I think it's everything that's happening for the women is really important, not, not to take away from that at all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there, like the men need a lot of support too. I mean, there, you know, there's part of me that's like, oh, <laughs> like, of course, you know, um, honestly, but, um, but it, it, it's true in what you're saying is, is true that, um, you know, there, it, our whole culture is perpetrating this, mm -hmm. you know, and so men need support in that they need to learn different ways of being and to be supported to be accountable and to change the way that they're taught by their mothers, by their fathers, by our culture, mm -hmm. you know? So a lot of things need to shift. Um, right now the focus is more and, um, and assistance and, um, sympathy, empathy, you know, more for women. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be there. 
you know? Well, yeah. Um, and, and when I say that, I, I mean, I think there is like, I don't know, it's, I'm going out on a limb a little bit by saying that mm-hmm. not because I don't feel that, but because I know kind of the, the reaction to that of there, there's, there's this kind of wide voice that like, this is the woman's time. Right. And in saying that, I don't mean to take anything away from women. I think that women need a lot of support. And I think that, um, the voice of women needs to be heard totally. Yeah. Yeah. And validated and acknowledged, um, by themselves. Yeah. As well as, as well as others. And it's most especially by men. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there is, there's a lot of anger that's coming out and, and in the sessions, you know, that I did yesterday, I, um, I helped my patients kind of get in touch with how that was manifesting in their bodies Mm -hmm. and in, um, you know, kind of going in and sitting with it and being in the sensation. And there's various ways that, you know, through imagery and through sense and sound and, and other ways that, that I will help people move through that. Um, but it's so vital for us all to feel what's there Mm -hmm. and that's what's coming out now Mm -hmm. is people are actually feeling it and it's kind of scary it's scary not only for the person feeling it but for other people but it's really necessary that it's it's felt and then channeled um because there's so much energy there and possibility Mm -hmm. but if it's and if it's not it comes out either, you know, either it it goes back in Mm -hmm. and it, and it really harms the person who's holding it or it explodes out and harms everyone else, you know? So if that energy can be channeled, then we could see some real shifts. And what are some outlets that you recommend to, to people for that? Um, there's, well, there's um, different groups that are having meetings um, around changing policies, um, marching. Um, oh, so ha- you're helping. saying like kind of like political action oriented. Political action oriented, um, helping other people, mm-hmm. socially action oriented, more more action oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, in in terms of. Uh, I don't know if you were asking in terms of kind of their own personal. That's what I was asking. But yeah. 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 So I, I think it's important to channel it out that energy, but that's after they have worked on it themselves. Yeah. And how I have them do that is again, you know, going into, um, recognizing what's happening in their body, the emotion, and then dropping into the physical sensation and exploring that. And really getting curious about it, being able to be with that, mm-hmm. writing about it, um, you know, exercise. Like there's there's lots of kind of therapeutic modalities, mm-hmm. um, it's screaming, you know, yeah. like, like channeling it in that way. Catharsis, also, yeah, yeah, can be helpful, mm-hmm. um, you know. Um, but eventually, uh, once once they've really gotten in touch with it and are not like so disconnected from it, then I think it's important to, to actually use that energy in productive ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not divisive ways. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause that's the danger of what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. This country is so crazy right now. Um, are most of your clientele women? Do you have mostly female clientele? Right now I do. Mostly, yeah. Do you like what what, what percentage? Uh, just out of curiosity. Oh gosh, it's like ninety percent right now. Ninety percent. Yeah. Do you think that? I mean, I I would imagine that in general, the people who seek therapy is definitely probably skewed more towards females. Wouldn't you say? Or mm-hmm. f- yeah, um, I would say yes. Except that I also specialize in anger management, mm-hmm. and. Um, a good percentage of the people who seek help for anger management in particular are men. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, it, it tend again, sort of generalizing here. Um, men tend to act it out. It's more socially appropriate, right? Yeah. To have anger. Whereas women depression, we turn it inward. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I'd like to talk. Um, I'd like to talk about men uh-huh. a little more. Okay. Because, um, well, I think it's important, and also, yeah, I, I've been noticing that my show and has been way skewed to the female perspective in general. Um, I just, it just seems like I know more women, um, in this area in particular. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I mean, I think I've had like probably 80% female guests or so, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about some of the things that men struggle with. Mm -hmm. And so I think anger is a huge one. Um, I know for me, I had, big anger problems growing up, like rage. And I was like super destructive. I I didn't have a a healthy outlet. I never learned, it was never taught to me. And I would like punch holes in the wall and kick holes in the wall. My dad was always like patching them up and yelling at me and stuff like that. Um, And yeah, there's, I think that part of the, healthy perspective that of, of of overall society that that's a huge part is that um a lot of men are angry and we don't know how to deal with our anger and mm. i think there's two parts like why are we so angry yeah. and and i don't think it's fair to say men are angry i think there's something behind that um so that's some that's say, a, say more what do you mean by that like, well, I think that, uh, I mean, men biologically are more aggressive. We know this, that, that the hormone testosterone um, leads to aggression. And the more testosterone you have, the more aggressive you are. That doesn't mean that you have to act that out unconsciously, that that can be channeled into healthy outlets. But so I think... In general, I don't think it's controversial to say that men are more aggressive than women. However, I I think that there there's something going on, and I don't entirely know what it is. We can discuss it, but there's something going on that is that is contributing to this anger that is in so many men underneath yeah. the surface yeah. that probably most of us aren't even aware of, and I think it starts young. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were talking about about body traumas and early life traumas, and a, a lot of men have been circumcised when they were little boys, including myself. And got to wonder how that affects a young person. You know, you're a couple days born, and somebody, you know, you're brought away from your parents, and somebody you don't know mutilates your genitals the most sensitive part of your body i mean that's that's got to do something to oh, yeah. a young psyche of course yeah i mean there there's so many layers just to that in part yeah um yeah i mean you're you're taken away and really it's usually your mom right mm-hmm. um and when you've been in utero like that's your world and you come out and then it's your mom or your primary caregiver and so you're taken away from your world, what yeah. you know of as safe. And generally, as it's the mom, that's like your first experience of a woman, mm-hmm. you know. And so, it, you know, back in the day, everything was blamed on, on the mom, mm-hmm. even schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. It was a schizophrenogenic mother that caused it, you know. Mm. So, but in a way... That is true that that early, early on, that's all you have. And so anything that happens to you kind of gets put in connection with your mom, your mm-hmm. primary caregiver. And um, yeah, it's I mean, it's incredibly traumatic. Mm-hmm. I, I am I, I'm it's still incredulous. It's appalling that, that that's a practice. Oh, yeah. It's appalling that, that, that that's yeah. still allowed to do. Mostly with no anesthetic. Mm-hmm. And... And I think people are like, eh, they're too young. They won't remember. Yeah. You know? So it gets stored in the body. It does. Right. And so it's your first kind of sexual experience. You know, there's, like I said, there's so many layers. Um, you're cutting off uh, uh, an innocent baby. 
Yeah. You know, you're inflicting pain. You're cutting off a huge percentage of their most erogenous tissue. Yeah. You know, which... I was pissed when I got older. I was like, yeah. what the fuck? Like yeah. when I just really learned, yeah, about, um, about all the nerve endings there and just yeah. that, yeah, my like sexual pleasure it, it was, you know, the, the full extent of my pleasure was taken from me, Yeah, you know? And I was like, I was mad. I was mad about that. I was mad at my parents, but, um, yeah. and may, may, I'm sure this has changed. Um, at this point, I think circumcision is a lot less popular than it was, but it, I'm still, I'm sure it's still practiced a lot, but it's still pretty popular. It was like when I, when I was born, it was around 99% of men of, of American men. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and from what I learned, like initially it was um, the Jews to mark them as slaves and they kind of took it over as their practice. The Jews were circumcised to so mark them as slaves. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and then they took it over as their practice, you know, and, and in most warrior cultures, there is some kind of barbaric ritual like that especially yeah. for the men, you know, barbaric is a good word. I totally I, think it's barbaric. I think it is too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I love babies and I care about them and, and their well being. you know, and I see what trauma does to adults because mm-hmm. I mainly work with adults now. Um, and I want to protect them, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're too young to consent. Yeah. You know, um, and, and it causes all of these issues. And there are many parents who are like, oh, it's my choice. And I, I think that's bullshit. Yeah. That you is. know, like it, you're doing irreparable damage to your child. Now right. there are many men who are circumcised and they're like, doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be more sensitive. You know, <laughs> I've heard that before. Uh-huh. Um, but the thing about that is that the foreskin actually protects um, the, the penis and it, um, provides like lubrication and, you know, it performs all these functions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know, we could kind of go down that rabbit hole, but, um, but certainly it, it does, it is, it is trauma yeah. to the child. Um, now taking a step away from circumcision, you know, how the baby is born mm-hmm. impacts a lot. Um, and then, you know, as you brought up earlier, whether they're breastfed or not, um, early influences as well, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the environment. Um, I actually, I wrote a dissertation on the role of empathy in the domestic violence treatment of male batterers. So I looked at, at from a feminist theory perspective, so I looked at um, what what was happening to feed into aggression in men Mm -hmm. and um you know our our society has been changing so back in the 50s 60s you know it's pretty easy for the um husband to be the breadwinner and there were more defined roles now as roles have changed men say they're you know the stereotypical um a husband and wife situation where then suddenly he's laid off mm-hmm. or um, his wife is making more money than him now, mm-hmm. you know, um, as those things started to shift, you saw more aggression coming out mm. when the, the role of the man is not as clear cut, mm-hmm. you know, and even now, even more so now with the, with, with me too and dating and consent, you know, where men really aren't sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways and things that feed into it. Um, then those are just, just a couple. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think too about, well, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's obvious to me that most of what adults deal with or a lot of what adults deal with has roots in childhood. Certainly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. And I don't think we can blame all of men's problems on circumcision. That's a, that's a big part of it. But yeah. I also think too, just about the difference in how we treat little boys and little girls and that, Certainly. um, girls receive more 
like care and nurturance and I mean, yeah, even little boys are told not to cry, Mm -hmm. you know, like, or even, you know, if your parents are real assholes, your dad might beat you for crying, you know, which is going to make you cry more. But, um, man up. Yeah, man up. Mm -hmm. Man up. And don't be a sissy or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that all of that kind of stuff is damaging. I think it certainly is. And um yeah, there there I don't mind talking about this, but it seems like there's a voice in society right now that like um doesn't want to doesn't want to acknowledge that men have had traumas too. And I'm not interested in comparing like who is the most traumatized. This is not a contest, but I think it all adds to like there there's a complex interaction happening and it's too easy and too simplistic to just blame men um or just to blame women because there's a lot of men out there that just they they blame women for you know them not being able to date do you know about incels there's a sort of you know what incels are Mm -mm. it stands for involuntarily celibate oh i have heard that yeah and the i don't really know that much about it there's all these little rabbit holes that i hear about and choose to not go down Mm -hmm. um but yeah they're like on reddit and messaging boards and stuff like that and there's kind of like a anti-woman sentiment uh that they brew up and pass around together of just yeah and that and that's that's dangerous sure just as anti-men yeah is dangerous right again that's a more divisive yeah, in a disconnected state. Yeah, I agree with you that um, certainly you know men have been traumatized, and now it's it's not it's not really. I mean, certainly we can explore that, you know. But out in the the general, it's not. I don't think the time to bring it up so much, you know. Yeah, I think I agree. It seems like that society as a whole. Yeah, they're in a pr- we're in a process right now individuals like our individual process we can move faster than society Mm -hmm. society tends to kind of move a little bit more slowly right and but i think that we will come to a time where there's more of like a uh, a dialogue or reconciliation that can Mm -hmm. happen yeah um and also a recognition of what men struggle with um because, yeah, I mean, men are far more likely to commit suicide. I mean, men are at yeah. risk in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and and to perpetrate. And that's the thing. Yeah. When we don't address what's going on with men, mm-hmm. then we set ourselves up to repeat the same patterns. Right. You know, just like I talked about kind of in the beginning of bringing it into the conscious mm-hmm. and your, your awareness. Mm-hmm. Now it's... It's all really up in in our collective mm-hmm. awareness, which it's kind of like what I would say to clients of mine when they come in and they're really triggered. You mm-hmm. know, like I know it doesn't feel good, but now you have a chance to to work on it. Mm-hmm. You know, now you can change it because it's up and you can see it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I feel like is happening now. Mm-hmm. So this is coming up. I think that it will be really important to also look at how we're hurting our boys and yeah. how we're indoctrinating them into this system. Yeah. Um, and it's it's necessary and it's part of the whole thing because nothing's going to change otherwise. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, 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 I look forward to the time where the that conversation can happen in yeah. public. And it, it's kind of, it, when it tries to happen, it gets shot down and, you know, yeah. I get it, but... Um, I think it's an important part of the balance perspective. And that's the only reason I just want to be clear to the audience too. And with you, that the only reason I bring it up is out of that kind of interest in balance, you know, yeah. and like I have no interest in like taking sides and, you know, I just want a, like a, a healthier country and a healthier society. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, uh, it's, it's not as much like balance in this conversation, but, but to, to help heal, we have to address all the parts. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, 
Um, I want to move on to another topic. Mm -hmm. And so I was interested to talk to you about um, the role. Well, I'm interested in psychedelics and I talk a lot about plant medicine and, and how, and I think that there is a value in the shamanic approach and the shamanic perspectives, um, which I have been interested in and delving into my own, my own self. And it's a, it can be a little bit hard to access, I think, because shamanism was a part of Western culture, but a long, long time ago, and it's pretty much non-existent, uh, or, um, very far removed from kind of the upbringing or experience of most people. But, um, it's coming into the public eye more and more. And a lot of the drug restrictions that were placed onto everyone, but even researchers are now gently being lifted. And, um, there's maps, which is, uh, I I actually don't know what it stands for. Do you (laughs) multidisciplinary? Uh, I don't remember the A. I don't remember the A either. Psychedelic studies or societies. Anyway, maps, Mm M-A-P-S, they, they do psychedelic research and Mm -hmm. they're researching MDMA in particular, probably other things as well, but they're most well known for that. Uh, John Hopkins has done some studies on psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in, um, mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. And, um, yeah, they gave, uh, what they call a large dose. I couldn't find exactly what, uh, what that quantity was, but a large dose to 50 people, uh, who were diagnosed with cancer and had like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, right anxiety that. and depression related to cancer and death, you know, or impen- impending death. And, um, it was wildly successful and 70% of people said that it was one of the most valuable, um, and spiritual experiences of their entire life. And then they checked in with them later and that there was lasting effects from this single, uh, large dose yeah. that, that people took and they found that um, psilocybin is a better treatment for depression than anything that's known. Any SSRI, any antidepressant, much greater than the placebo effect. It's a greater treatment for depression, at least based on the single study um, than anything else that we know of, which is pretty, a pretty, pretty tremendous finding. And, these kind of um, groundbreaking studies are, I think, opening the door to more and more research, which I think is super important. And I bought like a, a tome that was created by Dennis McKenna and some others. That's the last um, 50 years, I think, of psychedelic research that I am going to be picking through mm-hmm. probably over a long time mm-hmm. to try and understand that perspective. But I think that um, there's there's going to be a place for psychedel- psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or therapy uh, in integrating kind of these um, chemicals and um, plants into, I mean, and that's essentially what shamanism is or that's essentially the role of a shaman they're sort of like a psychedelic therapist um not always with substance though yeah that's true yeah not all shamans work with substances but Mm -hmm. at at least the yeah the one the the ones that do that shaman is kind of is playing that role of facilitator skilled Mm -hmm. facilitator Mm -hmm. so and i know that you don't you don't do that you don't practice that yourself but um I'm just curious your your we'll get more into some other stuff. What are your general thoughts on that kind of um opening uh field of therapy? I th- I think it's pretty exciting actually. Um especially for people who have intractable illnesses um and and even depression that's that's really heavy. Uh, Because I've worked a lot with people who are just so stuck in that cycle and it's hard to get out of that pattern. 
and they might get better for a while and try, you know, try a bunch of different drugs, but, um, eventually they seem to just kind of succumb to that pattern and, and their life seems pretty hopeless. Hmm. Um, and so this, this is a way I, I think, you know, using, um, psychedelics in that manner is a way to, um, expand their perspective Mm -hmm. you know and what happens in depression often is that like the perspective gets so condensed Mm -hmm. and everything all the energy everything just gets so constricted Mm -hmm. and stuck Mm -hmm. and it can be hard to see out of that Mm -hmm. and so anything that can really help to expand that um that is not harmful you know um i'm i'm definitely in in favor of um and that's, I think that's one of the, the biggest pieces of it is that ex- expansion, you know, the, the ability to not be stuck in just the one way of seeing things, but then um, notice how incredibly perfect the world actually is right. and, and to feel connected. And again, I, <laughs> I have to come back to that, you know, the, the connection versus disconnection because it's such a huge piece of what I see is wrong right now mm. in, our, in our culture. Mm-hmm. And that manifests in extreme ways in depression. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> in, you know, in the beginning of, the, of um, this segment, I was talking about um, kind of relational, interpersonal, kind of early psychodynamic therapies. Um, and in, in those, um, one of uh, the ways that they talked about people and people's development is kind of early on, you're in this fused state. Um, fused being like, there's just you and your mom, there's no diff- distance, you know, it's just this one thing. And then as she maybe doesn't feed you exactly when you're hungry, you move into this depressed state, which is realizing there's separation. Hmm. Um, and that as adults, we tend to kind of go in and out of those states and others. Um, but I, I have been recently thinking how um, depression is in that state. You know, you're just, you're so disconnected. And so I believe that psychedelics can be one way to re-experience that state of full connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, in my experience, super useful for just... Yeah, sometimes I can just get a locked into my point of view and have a hard time looking outside of it. And um, a psychedelic journey can just kind of lift me up above the cloud of my mind, essentially, is yeah. what it is. Just this like illusion, cra- like perfectly crafted by my mind. And I don't know how it works, but it just lifts me up out of that. And I can see it from a pie. And I'm like, whoa. Right. I'm just like operating within this little sphere, this little mind bubble. And I'm so convinced of this entire reality, but it's really just this, this single point amongst, you know, a a wider landscape. Right. And sometimes even just that helps me to kind of like break that spell that I've cast over myself. Yeah. And, and I think that, having it be assisted Mm -hmm. by people who are trained to help, um, you know, to recognize kind of what's happening on emotional, mental levels, to hold the space, to help guide you if you need it and to help you to make sense of it all, especially after the fact Mm -hmm. to help you integrate. I think that's the, um, uh, really the therapeutic part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're kind of in the wild west of psychedelic use is how I like to think of it. And um yeah, I mean most of these substances are still illegal, some of them highly illegal, schedule 1, which is the highest scheduling even marijuana is schedule 1, which and schedule 1 means um zero medicinal value. Uh so the mm-hmm. and we kn- we know that a lot of these plants have medicinal value but they just still right there's just this well, there's lockdown the, on them you know it's a lot of politics yeah. behind all that right right but i really think that i really sincerely think that we will who knows how long it'll take but we'll come to a point where uh we understand the value of these compounds and plants and we understand how to use them but i think that 
we're, we have neither of those things now on a bri- broader societal um, stage. Um, and But yeah, I say it's the Wild West because it's kind of like every man for himself or a woman. And um, most of us don't have access to a trained facilitator. And there are therapists who are using MDMA or psilocybin with their patients, but they're putting them, they're doing so illegally and they're right. putting themselves at risk by right. doing so. But they're taking that risk because they, I guess, see results and they see the value in it. Um, mm-hmm. But most of us who might want to access a psychedelic experience have to do so illegally and, um, you know, maybe the closest expert to them is their friend who maybe did it a couple times. Right. Right. And we don't have that shamanic tradition and those lineages that, um, other cultures have of, you know, sometimes lineages of thousands of years of, of people who are highly trained and like, that's their, that's their job, you know, um, they train their entire life for it, um, you know, mm-hmm. 10, 20, and their, 30 and their years. And, and exactly. Their grandparents and yeah. Yeah. And they speak about um, a transmission that happens down the line, right? And we were talking about genetic memory, right? And um, yeah, maybe there really is something to that, that if, your ancestors for 10 generations have been shamanic peoples. Then you come into this life mm, and this mm, body yeah. inheriting so much knowledge and wisdom. Right. And then you continue to learn yourself too. And, you know, we're like generation one or maybe two. Um, and I mean, psychedelic plants, like the, they first started really being brought in around the 1920s, as far as I understand. But, you know, they didn't hit mainstream culture until the 60s. And that wasn't that long ago. And we still right. really, yeah. And and I yeah. think it is important to at least know what you're doing yourself, but definitely have a trained facilitator if you can access one, because there are dangers to these compounds and certainly um, yeah Um, yeah especially i mean the thing is is it's actually um a good life lesson too but you know in going into any of these things is like if you have fear and you resist then then that's when it's painful right (laughs) that's when you know the shadows come up or the demons or the whatever it is that you might see you know Mm. that's when it gets scary Mm -hmm. um but if you can relax and allow and kind of surrender into the experience then um then things just unfold yeah um yeah and and if it was legal you know then that that would definitely be an area that i would um, be interested in because I do see the value. Yeah. Um, now there, there are people who go to ceremony, um, after ceremony, after ceremony, you know, and, and they're not, they may get these downloads or transmissions or life changing, you know, information and yet it doesn't stay. Right. Right. And so they're, they go back and they go back and they go back and, um, and there can be an addictive quality to that as mm-hmm. well. So um, where I see that the the biggest help that I can do and what I think is, is integral in that process if someone is going to um, try and use psychoactive substances um, as part of the therapeutic journey is to get good um, uh, kind of integration sessions. Definitely. Um, and, and that's the part that, that I can do now. Yeah, right. Okay. So is is that something that you you like offer to people in an official capacity that you can you can um is or is that something that you put on your website or anything like that or just something I haven't that put kinda... it I haven't put it on my website. It's not people know now officially. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah. I mean yeah. I, I that's good. Really 
with with any kind of life changing experience, you know, whether it's a big festival or go to Burning Man or you know whatever, you have some kind of life altering thing. Uh, it's really important to have a way to make sense of it and how to integrate that back into your life. You know, you there's people I know who gone to say Burning Man and they come back and they're like oh my god that was so amazing and you know I'm never going to work again and I'm I don't need any of this and you know yeah. and then their rent comes due and they're like oh <laughs> you know because they're back in this reality mm-hmm. and so whenever you go far out of this reality and then come back you know the, you need to have a way to integrate the experience mm-hmm. um, and Uh, And a lot of the things that I teach people to do um, in therapy when they come in are ways to be integrated in, into this reality. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm, I'm now reminded of a quote, Krishnamurti quote, uh, quote of it is, um, no measure to be well adjusted in a sick and no measure of health to be well adjusted in a sick society, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not so much that I'm trying to get people to sort of, I'm trying to get people to be well adjusted, but more so just to be kind of connected into themselves and grounded in themselves again so that they, so they can function or make, um, more rational choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I cleared with you beforehand if I could ask you about your personal mm-hmm. psychedelic experiences. I'd like to know, yeah, how did you, like what what kind of different ceremonies or plants have you uh, experienced and just what is your whole um, experience with uh, psychedelic plants? <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it started pretty early now are you you just talking about plant medicines in particular or all kind of psychedelics yeah all kind of all kind of like consciousness altering psychedelic experiences yeah um well the first time i can remember um which i didn't realize actually i had um eaten some acid when i was pretty young that uh without realizing yes oh wow yes um how old were you I think maybe like 10 or something like that. And um, I, I had a friend who was a little bit older and it was his his family had had it and hid it away, you know, hippies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talked to him about it some years ago. Um, and I was like, yeah. And I, I remember that sugar cube that like had nail polish on it and and I remember this big kind of scary tree with the roots. And he's like, you, that was acid. I <laughs> stole that from my stepdad. <laughs> um, so I didn't actually know until many years later. Um, but I did, um, you know, I think I, I started, um, I tried marijuana when I was younger. And, um, and that can be, I think, personally, it can be good medicine. Mm -hmm. because again it can provide a shift Mm -hmm. um now i'll jump for just a second i tell every one of my clients who come in to see me who smoke i ask them not to do that before they're going to come in to see me because as it alters your perceptions and the way you deal with your emotional states it's not so good when you want someone to actually be present in what comes up naturally Hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um now, if I was doing it in a therapeutic manner, that would be different, but it would have a different frame. Um, is it that you want to like, um, you want consistency from session to session or you want to, you want to work with them in that kind of sober mindset? I want to work with them as I see them as, as they kind of really are Yeah. not in an altered state. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, you know, if it was, it was legal and the purpose was that we were exploring things in this other state that would be different. Mm -hmm. Um, but as it is, and there are some people who smoke a lot. Um, but really my, my goal is to have the person be able to learn to manage their states without, without much else. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've experimented, um, you know, when I was much younger with different things. Um, and 
Some... Have you have you um, done any psych? Have, have you had any psychedelic experiences since becoming a therapist? And like, so I, I'm interested in your point of view, like as a as a mental health care professional. And yeah. Like, what did you get out of the experience, and what did you make of it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Earlier on, I started to work with a retreat center who was offering ayahuasca. Um, and so I was helping them. Um, I at least started to help them set up their intake program and the integration piece in particular. And so as part of being there, then I um, participated in some of the ceremonies. Um, and what I, what I found in my experience was that I didn't, for me personally, it, it didn't really show me anything new. Mm-hmm. It, it highlighted some connections for me. You know, one time I, I came out of it and I was just heartbroken around what we're doing to the earth, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so I'd, I'd gotten that on this really deep level. Mm. Um, and I've had various experiences like that mm-hmm. um, where I was, I went into a more expanded state, but I, I never felt like this um, life altering change. Mm-hmm. Um, and it may it may be because I have done a lot of personal exploration. Yeah. You know, while I was in school before that, um, my own therapy and and just various ways of knowing myself pretty mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. So so in terms of, of that experience I didn't um it it wasn't as helpful in terms of um finding something like incredibly different and, and long lasting. Yeah. Yeah. And how many experiences did you have at the retreat center? Uh, I don't, I don't exactly remember, but it w- wasn't, wasn't that many, maybe 10, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little less. Um, and yeah. And what I came to was like, uh, it's not, it's not my medicine. Mm-hmm. I think it can be helpful for some people. It's also hard on their system. And if they, if they do it, it needs to be really held, um, in a protected manner with, you know, again, shamans who have been doing it for a really long time and, and know how to, um, be aware of what's happening on all the multiple levels. Yeah. Yeah. And did that, did the center have, uh, experienced shamans there would you say I mean um, from your point of view not as much as I would have liked yeah. in, in hindsight mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, I've never been to a retreat center but I have heard that um, they're kind of hit or miss and there's some that are really bad there's yeah. some that just I don't uh, some people give more credibility to people who are like um native to that culture like indigenous peoples but um i don't i don't think that that necessarily gives i mean there's plenty of shamans from that culture that are really bad too right so that doesn't ne- that's not necessarily like doesn't even matter but um in in a way i feel like it's it's like the genetic loading like yeah. it's, they have more potential, sure. but there, yeah, there's, there's lots of, um, quote unquote shamans, you know, who, who cause damage to Definitely. people. So people need to be really careful. Yeah. And, um, the, those are now considered the old ways and a lot of, um, a lot of the sons and grandsons of lineage holders who, you know, like there are the the these kind of grandfathers that were raised in the old way from childhood but the the youth now there there's not as much interest in 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 learning their father's way they're more interested in just modern stuff and right and also just like western style materialism is rampant through central and south america now yeah and yeah, some of those ways are are starting to fall into less and less use. Um, but 
there still are a lot of good places to go. Um, so, um, so ayahuasca is not your medicine. Is there one that is that that clicks with you a little better? I would say um, there are two that I've found that I, um, when used in kind of a sacred manner, that I um, that are pretty helpful to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and one is marijuana. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like I mentioned, you know, it can it can really just be a connector in and a reminder. Mm. Um, and then the other is, um, it's a uh, toad medicine, uh, Bufo alvarius. And, um, and this I have had twice and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which is several years apart. Five MEO DMT, DMT. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is the stronger kind of DMT. Well, I, I've never done five MEO DMT, mm-hmm. but that's what people say. That it's uh it's quite a bit stronger. It's, it's really powerful, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, I did, I I tried it the first time because in the past years, I have been kind of going through a healing crisis, and the first year that it manifested, um, I had a lot of physical sim- uh, symptoms, um, rashes on the arms and legs, and really sick and um, uh. So when I was in that year, kind of coming to the end of that year, uh, a friend of mine told me about this and I was willing to try, you know, pretty much almost anything to, to shift the level of discomfort I was having in my body. Um, and so I, um, I went in and I learned right before I was going to do it that, um, some people when, um, when they it, you smoke it, um, and and it's like a is it a secretion from the it's toad? It's the is venom. It, okay. Yeah. Does yeah. that come Just from dried. a gland, or it's like scraped off of its back, or something like no, that? No, it's from. Um, I think it comes out like from their their teeth, their fangs, or something. Oh. Something like that. I'm not actually okay. 100 percent sure, but I know that. Um, you know they they have to harvest it. Yeah. From them. And there's, there's different ways that they do that. Um, and, um, in ways that are not so invasive too, mm-hmm. and, you know, don't harm them. Um, but, um, I, what I learned right before was that some people feel like they're actually dying, like suffocating or choking, um, uh, cause it's ego death. Right. And, and I, then I got kind of scared because sure. I, I have a strong sense of ego and, you know, yeah. Um, so I talked to the, the facilitator beforehand, um, and he, you know, kind of reassured me a little bit and, and, um, since I, I was pretty resolved to do it. So, um, and where were you for this? Was this at the retreat center or no, 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 this was, I, I had stopped working with the retreat center Mm -hmm. for maybe a couple years Mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and, um, no, it was um, a friend's house, and she was hosting someone who, um, from another country, mm-hmm. um, who who was a doctor and who brought it around, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and so you smoke it and you hold your breath, and then um, in this case, then I laid back onto this kind of bed. It's just one. Uh, he did it where it was just one person at a time. And I think he played flute and, you know, did some stuff. And um, he actually videoed the first uh, maybe 20 seconds uh, or 10 seconds of me um, in this experience. And so I laid back and then then you see me like my eyes are open. I'm breathing really deeply and just like, <gasps> mm-hmm. you know, and um, and the experience that I felt um, I saw like a little bit of colors and a little bit of music and then expanded. And I felt my senses just expand and expand and expand. And it was incredibly bl- blissful. Um, and it, it gave validity to my thoughts or my belief before that when we're not in these bodies, we're just kind of, you know, connected with everything. Mm-hmm. 
And I actually felt that. Yeah. And so it was um, incredibly powerful for me. Mm-hmm. And then gradually I kind of came back in and, and I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like we're in these separate bodies to have this experience. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like, you know, some people have near-death experiences and kind of come back with that. Mm. Um, and it was it was incredibly powerful to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and afterwards, the, the kind of funny part is the um, facilitator, shaman-ish person, um, said, oh, you did great. You just relaxed right into it, you know, no problems. And I, I looked at him and I was like, that was for him. Like, I don't need that. Like I was just everything, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I, I didn't need reassurance. I just, I Mm -hmm. was in it and Mm -hmm. I just was Mm -hmm. and wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, you know, the, the entire thing of, um, I think talking and then kind of coming back and all that took maybe 45 minutes. Mm. Um, the actual intensity of the experience was probably like 15 Mm -hmm. minutes so it's pretty fast and it's easy on your body as compared to like ayahuasca yeah 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 and would you say that you had an out-of-body experience so did you leave your body like you weren't you weren't in the room anymore like in your experience oh yeah i mean like i said i expanded into everything yeah so there was no body there was there was everything and nothing at the same time right Wow. And then, and was that kind of like a gradual transition or did you kind of have that like shot out of a can and DMT experience? Um, I'm, it was only slightly gradual. Just like I said, I, there was a little bit of, as I was expanding, I saw a little bit of color yeah. and heard a little bit of like music and, and then was gone. Yeah. 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 Some, of, some of, my experiences have brought me that kind of that, a similar feeling of like, it's so obvious that we're more than these bodies. Right. But it's, it's a lot less obvious just in a normal state of consciousness, but yeah, expanding beyond the body or yeah, going to other dimensions or all kinds of things are accessible through psychedelics, especially DMT. But, um, because, yeah, I think a lot of the sort of clinical external perspective is uh, it's unknown whether, well, I think most people think it's a hallucination that, um, you know, these chemicals are affecting your brain in a certain way and you're having this hallucination. Right. And maybe uh, people will have common hallucinations, mm-hmm. but it's all in the mind. I mean, all this is in the mind, too. Right. Right. Yeah, that's you, true. You think you're hearing my voice outside of yourself. You're hearing it inside yourself. It's, yeah. You know. Right. Uh, everything I'm experiencing is through yeah. my sensory organs, which are interpreted by my brain. Totally. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess in a sense they're right. But, yeah, well, that's a deeper existential question. Right, that I don't right. Know We're not going to get into that right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I'm... A little curious to try 5-MeO DMT, mm-hmm. but I found regular DMT, which is called NN DMT, to be fairly intense. And I did it maybe 30 times over, um, I don't know, probably a total of six months. And then, yeah. Um, and yeah, I had some fascinating experiences, but it was, it was hard for me to get comfortable with it. I never quite was able to actually fully relax into it. Hmm. Um, it because, and maybe five MEO is different, but I found it to be very aggressive. It's just, it's such an intense kind of jarring experience. And I think I have egoic structures, strong egoic structures that have trouble letting go. And apparently the trick to undoing those is to smoke even more uh that you gotta really you gotta really like well terence mckenna's uh suggestion is to hit the pipe as hard as you can and hold it in and then blow it out and then take do the same thing the second time 
And he says, the trick is you got to go for that third hit. And after the second hit, you won't want to. You're like, why would I possibly do this again? Because you're already starting to lift out and starting to see colors. But he says that that trick is you got to, you got to hit the third one and then you won't even feel yourself letting go of the pipe or laying back. You just get that full, full cannon blast. Hmm. And I only did that one time and I went, I went fully out of body. I happened to be in a hot tub at the, Ooh. at the time, that which seems a little sketchy. Uh, well, there were other people there and, um, we took turns. So, you know, uh, yeah, it was an interesting choice. We were like, cause yeah, we were like going to go in the hot tub. I don't know. It just kind of came together, but, um, yeah, I went really fully out of body. And so I had a similar experience every time up until that. And I went even farther and what the, every time I would kind of go through this kaleidoscopic tunnel of colorful shapes and geometries. And that was the kind of like coming on period is I would definitely had this sense of moving like kind of like in Star Trek, how they go warp speed and mm. you see all the stars fly past you. It's like that, but with like, with like different shapes and geometries. And then I would come into what other people described as the room. And it's kind of like being inside of an interdimensional grandfather clock. There's all of these impossible to describe shapes that, um, they, they sort of like oscillate between poles. They kind of like, just like a grandfather clock's pendulum kind of swings back and forth, but there's all these kind of geometric mechanisms inside of this room. That's really fascinating. You can't possibly even take it all in. And, um, that's where I would go every time. I'm going to take a little drink of water. That's where I would go every time. And then as a DMT would wear off, then I would kind of like back out of that room and that room would just get, I would, was, hmm. I guess going back through the tunnel and then I would be back into my body. Did, did you ever try and set an intention first? Yeah. Yeah, I did. But I, I mean, I honestly, I didn't even really know what to I always set an intention every time, but usually my intention was like fairly open. Like, you know, my intention is to, um, uh, I'm trying to think what my intention actually was. I can't recall. It was a while ago, but it would be pretty general. Like my intention is to receive what, a um, what is in my highest benefit at this time, something like that. Mm -hmm. Cause like I didn't, it was such a foreign place to me. I didn't even know what to ask for. So I just asked for, to receive what, it, what it is that I didn't even know I needed or, mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. But this one time in the hot tub, um, I went into the room and then I went th up through the ceiling of the room and I got to a new place that I'd never been in before. Hmm. And, um, I saw that's even harder to describe, but it was kind of like looking into a mirror when there's a mirror behind you and you see like a thousand mirrors. Mm -hmm. It was like that, but in crazy psychedelic color. And then, um, I don't remember. I kind of like, it was actually really intense. I think my mind was just like, Nope. Like I, I couldn't hang. It was just so, to cope with it was hmm. just so wildly foreign um but a friend of mine was um so we had gone around the circle once one at a time and then we were doing it in pairs so there was a, a woman a good friend of mine who um she's now in ayahuasca but at the time wasn't and um she did it at the same time and apparently unbeknownst to me because I was completely out of body but we were like in sync in this way and um and like 
like I made some big cathartic noise. And then at the exact same time, she went like, <gasps> and like opened her arms. And um, she said she had this like psychedelic vision of this like eagle or like phoenix that like moved like out of the earth and through her body and out of her crown. And none of this was, I was not aware of this. And I was like, I did what? I made a noise. Like I didn't even know. Um, but yeah. And then as I was coming back into my body, I, I had completely forgotten that I was in a hot tub and I was up against the jet that I had a jet at my back. And, uh, I almost, I almost freaked out because I didn't know where I was. And I felt like I was still halfway in the cosmos and I felt like I was like a boiling chicken in a pot or something <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> and luckily I realized that I was just in a hot tub, but I was all, almost freaked out. But, um, anyway, thanks for listening. That was fun to tell, but, um, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty wild chemical, which, you know, our own brain makes, and yeah, uh, we have receptors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons it works so well and that it, it's, it's such a clean experience um, because our brain knows exactly what this chemical is and, um, and where it goes and how to break it down cleanly. <clears throat> um, now, of course, the brain isn't used to having that much in it. So maybe that's not good for it, but... In my experience, it's a pretty, like, uh, uh, I'll come back to completely normal consciousness, yeah, with well within an hour mm -hmm. and be totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's only a few other times when your brain produces, like, a big amount, right? Yeah, when you're born and when you die. And orgasm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Not quite as much, but yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, um my second experience mm -hmm. um that i had uh was um completely different and with the toad medicine yeah okay yeah and i w this time i wanted to um uh be present and to stay connected and to actually um I mean, I remembered what happened, but there was a whole period of time where I just wasn't in the first time, you know? So I, I really wanted to like, you know, ask, am I on the right track? Am I, mm. um, you know, what do I need to know? Am I doing what I need to do? That, that kind of thing. Um, and it was last year when I was uh, in the third year of these kind of healing crises that I went through. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, that, that last year was, um, the end of like the energetic oversensitivity, um, and shifting into, um, like a more spiritual or kind of, I, I would say all of them, mm -hmm. um, cause I went through a physical oversensitivity, then an emotional oversensitivity, and then, um, that energetic oversensitivity. So, um, so I was wanting to kind of put it all together mm. and, and figure out, you know, how it could shift. Um, and this was a, a different person held a space whose family had been, um, practicing, um, these types of, uh, of medicine and healing, um, and, and others. Um, and so this time, uh, I started standing up, um, and, um, and as I was, um, smoking it, he told me to keep my eyes open. And so I did, and they stayed around me, um, to make sure, you know, I didn't fall. <laughs> um, and as I, um, started to, uh, feel it a little bit more, um, what happened was that it went from like 3D experience to 4D experience to 5D to 6. Like everything just kept expanding outward hmm. more and more. Um, and yet I was, I was still here, mm -hmm. you know, here and, and not here. And Can you describe a little bit more of like what, what is that, if, if you can, what does that feel <clears throat> like? 
the different like when you go to 4d or 5d i mean what is that how is that different well so you know if you're looking at a movie screen and you see something on the movie screen in a couple dimensions and then you put on the 3d glasses Mm -hmm. and you see those um so in a way it was like that multiplied yeah so my um both my um my visual perception, but all actually all my perceptions just expanded. Um, and it, and things took on almost a cartoony, um, kind of, um, extra vivid experience. So it was like, um, I was seeing it and feeling it at the same time, um, and expanding outward and outward and outward. Um, and then there was a moment where things started to turn black and gray and um and seem ominous and scary you know and i i had this thought like oh gosh is is it gonna is it gonna go that way like Mm -hmm. am i gonna have this really scary experience because you know some people feel like they're actually in hell right and are burning and and going through the labyrinth or that they're at injustice day and their you know their their sins are being weighed and they're seeing all their life or whatever so i i had this thought i was like oh is it is it really going to be that way and then i had this kind of higher voice a more expanded wisdom voice you know it's in my head um say like well you asked to see everything Mm. this is just part of it Mm -hmm. and and so then the smaller part of me was like oh Oh yeah, of course. Mm. <laughs> and as soon as I, you know, relaxed and and surrendered to the experience, then everything shifted again. Um, and then I expanded, and then um, I could. I was both present in in the um, in the afternoon in the place where I was, and looking at um, at this hill, um, which is where I had you know, was taking it. Um, and so I was seeing the hill and uh, all these other things. And I remained standing the whole time Hmm. and felt just so much energy kind of moving through me. Um, and at one point I just started like dancing a little and shaking and kind Mm -hmm. of moving the, the energy. But, um, but I, I remained standing, um, until I got to a much later place. Um, and then I took off my boots and, you know, went and put my hands and feet in the dirt and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that time, had a lot more information kind of come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, I didn't feel that level of bliss and connectedness that I felt um, in, in the other experience. I did feel connected and blissful but not that extreme level Mm. when that's all there was yeah you know um but it was still it was still pretty powerful uh and i i felt really good and solid and and integrated when i came back Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i'm curious i'm still curious about that interdimensional experience you described because i've had some interdimensional experiences too i'm just curious if there's some overlap um so did you you felt like you were perceiving aspects of reality that you normally that are there but that you don't normally perceive would you say that that's true yes yeah and um i mean what what was there if you because I mean, for me, it's more of a feeling like I, I, I'm opening my eyes and I'm looking around and I'm still just seeing the 3D reality. It's not really like a visual, like we're such visual creatures normally. I think mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's our dominant sense, certainly. But for me, that kind of interdimensional perception is more of a feeling. It's hard to it's hard to put it into words mm. because I don't tend to be super visual in oh. psychedelic experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had my eyes open, and so I was looking at what was there, mm. and so it just, there was just so, like so much more dimension and depth and layers. Mm. Um, but it's yeah, it's hard to 
it's hard to put it into words and to even to speak of all the the um the details of it yeah it's kind of it's very it's very elusive to language Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. i felt like um i felt like uh there were well people talk about the veil like beyond the veil right and I actually, I could, I felt like I was within a sphere, that there were these like spheres to reality and that the third dimension, our, our normal reality is just one sphere hmm. and that somehow I was able to expand yeah. beyond that into yeah. like, I also went to the sixth, what I felt like was the sixth, sixty, um, interestingly. And uh, yeah, I went to four or five and six. And this was during an uh, LSD experience. And yeah, like it wasn't something that I could touch. It wasn't in my physical space, but it was in my psychic space Mm -hmm. somehow. Um, Did you feel it kind of in your body as well, kind of energetically? Yes, but um, I, I felt like I could feel what was in my physical space as if it was my body. So I could feel the ground. I could feel other people. I could feel like not tactically, not, not like it was my skin, but Mm -hmm. I could, like if somebody was walking across the ground, I could feel that pressure. Yeah. I could sense that. Um, and so I felt like my body was expanded in a way Mm -hmm. and yeah, that like, um, and I've actually felt too, that there's this part of me, which people call the astral body which normally is right tight on my physical body. Mm -hmm. And I could actually feel that body expand into a larger space. And there's no limit to um, how large that can expand. And maybe that accounts for these kind of universal cosmic experiences that people have. Maybe, you know, um, we can just expand that astral body into all of reality so that really we are everything we've expanded ourselves to yeah to be able to like perceive that <clears throat> somehow well you know it, it reminds me of you know the first experience where i just was everything and then came back into <laughs> this yeah. very separate you know this body but on not just on kind of metaphysical levels but even on basic um, scientific levels, like where we are just energy, we're, we're matter, we're electrons and, you know, and, and so we are mixing with everything. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we're very separate, but we're actually not. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not even, you know, being esoteric. (laughs) Right. Totally. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is, not widely accepted now, but I think that as time goes on, we're going to find, um, yeah, hopefully science will start to, I don't know. It doesn't even matter to me personally. Like I've had my personal experience that is convincing to me. Um, but I'm curious to see what science discovers, you know, Mm -hmm. like I, I don't need that kind of like confirmation from science, but I am, curious and i think it would be beneficial to you know humanity as a whole to kind of understand what is actually going on in some of these cases yeah well as as um brain imaging and um uh other types of um imaging and the research and the studies get um, more precise then we may be able to learn a lot more about what's actually happening, you know, at least in our brain and then on these subtle, more subtle levels as Mm -hmm. well, you know, when we're in these experiences. It reminds me, um, years ago, there was a video that was put out, um, Jill Bolte Taylor. Have you seen that one? No. Um, It's called My Stroke of Insight, I think. And she was um, maybe a neuroscientist or some kind of, researcher and um and then had a stroke and it affected her her whole I think the right side of her brain um and basically she had this kind of experience where she was in the shower and then all of a sudden she couldn't like 
like she lost touch with her physical capacities and then kind of expanded like her um the the um her external um all of her surfaces all her boundaries where her body was just kind of like dissolved Hmm. um and she just was as well Hmm. did she come back from that oh yeah yeah she came back okay um and then gradually um was repaired enough to go back to researching and you know and speaks about this experience it's pretty fascinating yeah Mm -hmm. i remember a story i learned in school about um a similar type person who yeah was studying the brain and she had a she had a stroke and she knew she was having a stroke and she went to the phone to dial for help it's the same oh it's the same person yeah oh okay yeah and in the story like she um like the she couldn't recognize the symbols Mm -hmm. like just that part of her brain wasn't working and um uh i'm not i'm not i can't remember how she i think she was able to dial for help but but maybe by like the placement of the keys and not the symbols i can't Mm -hmm. remember but Mm -hmm. these symbols were just like totally foreign language to her she couldn't understand right and then gradually lost all touch with the physical wow yeah, I didn't learn about that extended part in school, but yeah, if you can, you know, the video's up on on like YouTube. You mm-hmm. can check it out, Jill Bolte Taylor. Okay. So we're coming to a close. We've been talking for over two hours, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you want to speak to, just like wrapping up here, or any kind of like, um, yeah, pieces of anything we've discussed? Uh, there was one more thing that I wanted to say about the last experience that I had mm-hmm. and and that that kind of higher uh, sense of knowing mm. um, and the the voice that kind of spoke to me was like, well, you asked for every, you know, you wanted to see it all. Um, and is that afterwards for some weeks after um, it was like I just knew things, mm. you know, and like i mean a very small example is um i think i wanted my chapstick or something and i reached into my um purse and just immediately found it Mm -hmm. it's like little things like that just kind of flowed Mm. more easily which Mm -hmm. is which is really interesting Mm -hmm. um and i felt more connected in that way Mm. yeah there there's some there's some kind of I don't know what to call it, but um, I I had an experience where I was at I was at this big party in Maui, um, on this large land, and there's people all over, and I had lost my car key out of my pocket somehow, in this huge field, and I was like, fuck, like, I'm never gonna find this key. It was already dark, and um, I sat down and I was like, let me just try and like use my psychic powers to find it and i just sat down and i meditated and i was like just show me where this key is and um i got an image in my mind of where the key was and i walked over there and it was exactly there and i never would have found this key um and i have no i can't explain it but um yeah there there's things like that that um yeah, uh, maybe maybe science will tell us one day, but yeah, it's. I think you know, in some ways, it's a it's a pretty exciting time. It's like we know, you know, coming back into sort of brain science and um, the ability to track uh, where certain, say, pharmaceutical drugs impact you. Mm. You know, it's like they're they're starting to be able to go into such minute detail. Mm. and register these little tiny changes, you know, and, and even find like there's a, a place on your, um, on your genes where in your DNA, where, um, uh, it can show whether you're a fast or slow metabolizer, you know, and then knowing that then you would want to take less of something mm. cause it'll stay around in your body for longer, you know, mm-hmm. or more, um, and all, all kinds of things, like very um, uh, just it ways that we never would have thought were possible. 
Um, and we know, you know, certain parts of the brain then control these um, very specific um, behaviors and functions. And then we also find out that we actually don't know hardly anything, you know, right. that, that yeah. there's people born who say have like no cerebellum, but they can kind of walk and move around and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe don't have specific areas of their brain that, um, are supposed to help you say with your memory or, you know, whatever. Um, and yet like that person can still function. Mm. And, um, so uh, we're, we know so much more and we also know how much now we don't know. Yeah. Which is important. And so important to know that you don't know. Yeah. Beginner's right. mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been super interesting. And yeah, um, you're welcome. I love the feeling of having a two hour conversation and feeling like we've barely scratched the surface. Um, There's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, just one final piece. Like, um, I do, I do hope that we can, as a scientific community discover, yeah, more, um, first off, release the taboos about researching these kind of things about, um, you know, psychedelics or, um, we'll call it paranormal phenomenon or whatever, whatever you want to classify it as. I think there's something there for myself personally. I try to walk a tight line of not believing or disbelieving. Um, and my personal experiences are valuable to me. And that's kind of why I've sought them out is I want to have the experience. Um, but I know that humans are, we're capable of talking ourselves into crazy beliefs and I don't want sure. to, I don't want to just, launch myself into fantasy land of um, believing in this or that just because I want to have an experience of it. Um, and and sometimes even the experience then doesn't mean that it's Exactly. Real. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It, um, it, we know for that um, we now know that uh, like eyewitness testimonies, mm -hmm. right, are mm -hmm. not necessarily accurate. No, at all and no. wildly inaccurate mm -hmm. they're not i don't know if they're still admissible in court but um yeah we know that like it, and even just memory in general memory corrupts over time oh sure every, every time yeah every time you um think about your memory you're kind of like taking it out and it changes yeah so with this in mind i i, I try to be very careful in what it is I try to actually not believe in every, in anything. Right. But we still have to go on with our lives. And, um, I am a curious person interested in exploring myself and I'm especially interested in the kind of like that cutting edge frontier of what's known, um, either by society or, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm lucky enough to be able to discover something or bring, bring forward something that, um, from these like f farthest reaches, you know, going interdimensional and uh, talking to non-physical sentience and things like that. So it's a fun exploration for me. I try not to take it too seriously, but mm -hmm. I do think that there's something really valuable there that we don't quite understand Yeah. as of yet. I, I would have to say I agree with you just on that last point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you once again, Dr. Lowy. You can find me on the Instagram at Chronicles of a Psychonaut and Facebook at Chronicles of a Psychonaut. And while you're there, drop me a follow or a like. And um, let's see what else is coming up. Uh, I recorded another episode with Halo this week, which was just as good as the first one, if not better. Um, and that's going to be coming out soon. And next week I have an interview with a friend of mine and we're going to talk about death and um, just go deep into, not the darkness, but the I see a light side of death and that death is just a part of life. And I think that there is a really healthy perspective on death to achieve that many people maybe don't come to until the very end of their lives because 
it's kind of a terrifying thing. We're all going to die. There's nothing you can do about it. So we're going to get into that. And thanks very much. See you later.